Hello, K-Hubbers. Look at this picture. Can you guess what body of water is this? I'll give you clues. It is a well-known river which can be found in Metro Manila. That's right! This is a picture of the old Pasig River. It was very different than what it is today, right? Pasig River was very clean and beautiful then, but due to negligence in industrial development, the river has become very polluted and is considered dead by ecologists. But most people believe that Pasig River is still able to sustain life. That is why there are a lot of attempts to rehabilitate it. Do you know that the best indicators of water quality are the invertebrates living in the water? These are animals without backbones or spinal columns. Dr. Giuseppe T. Bio, a world-class educator and the first Asian to win the Intel International Excellence in Teaching Award, will take us for a trip to learn more about invertebrates which are classified under Kingdom Animalia. Hi, Miss Abby. Hi, Kay Havers. We are here now at the Fish World Museum of the Southeast Asian Fisheries and Development Center in Tigbawan, Iloilo. CIFDEC is a research center where studies on coastal resources and sustainable development are conducted. Fish World is also dedicated to science and environmental education, especially among the young, under the tutelage of the chief scientist and curator of this museum, Dr. Doris Bagarino. So today, we will use some of these collections as we study the animal kingdom. Can you name some animals you're familiar with? Dogs. Cats. Fishes. Okay, your answers show that you're familiar with animals with backbones. But do you know that 97% of animals on Earth don't have backbones? These are the invertebrates. In fact, the invertebrates comprise 27 phyla in the animal kingdom. Animals with backbones comprise only a portion of one phylum of animals. This is phylum chordata. Today, we are going to discuss the characteristics of the eight major phyla of invertebrates. We will also familiarize ourselves with examples of animals under its phylum. Ma'am, what characteristics do all animals, whether vertebrate or invertebrate, share in common? That's a very good question, Ashley. All animals are multicellular. Unlike the bacteria or proteins, no animal is made up of a single cell. Animals don't possess cell walls, unlike plants. Animals don't have chlorophyll, so they do not undergo photosynthesis. In other words, all animals are heterotrophic. Fourth, all animals are capable of sexual reproduction. Sponges and corals can reproduce asexually by budding or fragmentation, but they are also capable of producing egg cells and sperm cells. Fifth, all animals are capable of making rapid response to the environment. When you touch a hot object, how do you react? Well, I immediately take off my hand from the object without even thinking. Yes, but plants cannot do that. And lastly, 
All animals can move at a certain stage in their life. Corals and sponges may be attached or sessile, but they have a free-swimming larvae. Ma'am, which group of animals first appeared on Earth? Vertebrates or invertebrates? Fossil evidence show that the invertebrates were the first group of organisms to evolve on Earth. This is called the Venus flower basket. Of course, this is not a basket. But this is a sponge, and sponges live in the deep part of the oceans. This is the skeleton of the sponge, and this is made of silica. You know, sponges are the simplest multicellular organisms. They don't have tissues nor organs, but the individual cells can react to changes in the external environment. In fact, the sponge body is composed of three types of cells. We have the epithelial cells, the color cells, and the amoeboid cells. Now, what have you observed? The body is full of holes. Yes, sponges are full of holes. Look at this. This is also another example of a sponge. That's why sponges belong to phylum Porifera. Porifera refers to the holes. In sponges, these are also called ostia. I mentioned a while ago that sponges are made up of three types of cells. The external cells are called the epithelial cells. The epithelial cells line the outer covering of the organism. Some epithelial cells are specialized to form the pore cells. Pore cells line the openings or the ostia. When there are harmful substances in the environment, the pore cells close. Thus, the pore cells regulate the amount of water entering the sponge body. Inside the sponge body, we have the color cells. The color cells have flagella. The movement of the flagella maintains a constant flow of water inside the sponge body. They also produce pickles, which form the skeleton of the sponge. Another function of the color cells is that they produce sperm cell and egg cells. Then between the epithelial cells and the color cells, we have a special group of cells. Where do sponges live and how big can they grow? Sponges live in the deep part of the ocean and they can grow as big as 2 meters. How do sponges eat? Well, as I mentioned before, there are special cells called the amoeboid cells. Food particles filtered by the color cells are brought to these amoeboid cells where they are digested. How do sponges reproduce? Amoeboid cells also produce sperms and eggs. Sperms and eggs unite inside the body of the sponge and they develop into free-swimming larvae. The free-swimming larvae move out of the body of the sponge through the bigger holes we call the osculum. The free-swimming larvae then attach to the stones or to hard substrate in the bottom of the sea and they grow into new sponges. What is the importance of sponges to the ecosystem? There in the ocean floor, they become homes of other organisms like small fishes, mollusks, and crustaceans. Some mollusks also eat the sponges. Dried skeleton of sponges like these are used to scrub our floors, scrub our cars, and clean our homes. To what phylum do corals belong? That's a very good question, Alfonso. Corals belong to phylum Nidaria. You see, corals eat small organisms for food, but that is only 5% of their food requirement. 95% of their food requirement is supplied by a protozoan that lives in symbiotic relationship with the coral. That protozoan, the zoosanctile, lives inside the body of the coral. Since it is photosynthetic, it manufactures food through photosynthesis, and that serves as the food for the coral. The zoosanctile also helps the coral convert excess food into calcium carbonate which becomes the skeleton of the coral and which builds the reef. Now, 
when there are changes in environmental conditions in the sea, like when there is global warming or rise in temperature, that becomes very disturbing for the coral. It's very stressful for the organism. So sometimes because of this stress, the zooxanthellae are expelled from the bodies of the coral. When zooxanthellae are expelled, the corals die. And that is what we call coral bleaching. Do you know that the Philippines has one of the most diverse coral reefs? But sad to say, many of our coral reefs are dying. This is because of illegal fishing practices and pollution. Now, we will discuss the three types of worms. All worms are invertebrates. Worms belong to three different phyla. Flatworms belong to phylum platyhelminthes. The round worms belong to phylum nematoda, and the segmented worms belong to phylum anilida. Flatworms are the simplest group of multicellular organisms which already possess certain types of organs. Look at this crab. What are most distinguishing in this crab? It has joint appendages. Very good, Alfonso. And they have external skeletons. Okay, this crab has an external skeleton, an exoskeleton called the carapace. This exoskeleton is made of chitin. Now, the crab belongs to phylum arthropoda. All arthropods possess jointed appendages. Also, all arthropods possess an external skeleton, also known as the exoskeleton. What do you think is the importance of that exoskeleton in the crab? It protects the internal organs of the crab. Very good, Lorenzo. It also protects the organism from predators. Yes, that's true, because chitin are difficult to digest and are hard. Organisms will not eat the crab. Ma'am? Point out the differences between insects, arachnids, and crustaceans? That's a very good question, Ashley. Arthropods are made up of three very important classes of organisms. So we have the insects, the arachnids, and the crustaceans. Insects have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings. The capacity for flight distinguishes the insects from other groups of arthropods. In fact, it is because they can fly that insects are very successful on land and any type of habitats. The arachnids are the spiders and their relatives. Scorpions are also arachnids. They possess eight legs. The crustaceans have two pairs of sensory antennae and their legs vary in number. The shell, the clams, the octopus, and the squid belong to phylum mollusca. In these organisms, there is a mantle which produces shells in shelled species. This shell belongs to class Gastropoda because it has only one shell. Do you know that this triton is a very important organism in the reef? This eats the crown of thorn starfish which damage our reefs. So when these organisms are collected and they are removed from the reef, there is an overpopulation of the crown of thorns. And this overpopulation of crown of thorns can destroy our coral reefs. But do you know that this is already endangered? The squid and the octopus are also mollusks. They belong to Classifalopoda. They are the swiftest and the smartest of all invertebrates. In fact, the octopus has a brain which is exceptionally large for an invertebrate. Can you cite some importance of mollusks? Mollusks may be sources of food. Yes, in fact, they are sources of food. I know you like eating seashells. These are used in furniture and other home fixtures. Yes, they are used as home decorations. Pearls from shells can also be used in jewelry. Look at this sea star. What have you observed? It has many bumps on its skin. That is right. These are spiny projections from the endoskeleton. And these are made up of calcium carbonate. 
In fact, that is the characteristic of echinoderms. Echinoderms have spiny projections. The sea star is an example of an echinoderm. And do you know how this organism moves? It moves by means of its tube feet. What are other examples of echinoderms? So aside from the sea stars, we have the sea urchins, the sea lilies, the sea cucumbers, and the brittle stars. Sand dollars are also echinoderms. As their name implies, all these organisms live in the sea. They are marine aquatic organisms. We have discussed the eight major phyla of invertebrates. Now, can you name some importance of these organisms? They are sources of food. They are not only delicious, but are also nutritious. Very good, Ashley. Many species of clams and gastropods and mollusks are edible, and they are very important sources of protein. Soil invertebrates break down organic matter and help release nutrients for nutrient cycling. Very good, Lorenzo. How about you, Alfonso? Bees, wasps, and other insects are common pollinators and help in plant reproduction. So, as you can see, invertebrates comprise the majority of organisms on this planet. They are important not only in the food chain, but in the maintenance of our ecosystems. Thus, let us protect these organisms, which are vital for the survival of this planet. One key ecological role invertebrates play in ecosystems is they can give clues to the pollution history of a particular part of the river or lake once they are caught and identified. By sampling different locations, it is possible to locate the source of any polluting incident. There is a general rule that better water has a larger number of different invertebrate species, and by counting the number of different types of creatures, it is possible to get a rough idea of water quality. Such knowledge is handy in our efforts to rehabilitate any body of water. Knowing the origin of any polluting incident betters our chances in preventing water pollution. See you next time, K-Hubbers! Bye!